Welcome. I'm Dr. Angela Mazza, a thyroid, endocrine, and metabolism specialist with an integrated practice in Central Florida. Today's topic is thyroid disruptors and their impact on thyroid health. As our listeners know, my goal for this podcast is to define and demystify the thyroid gland and thyroid-related medical conditions. By providing information in an easy-to-understand format, I hope to help patients better understand the ways in which their bodies work and to help them thrive. I'm glad that Dawn Sheffield, my friend and co-host, and always very lucky aw, patient, is here with me for episode 18. And thank you so much for having me back. This is such an interesting topic. I think many of us may not know a lot about, nor even hear much about, thyroid disruptors. I certainly really don't see much about it, and I don't think I did for decades, Um it might be that a little more information about these potential hazards are showing up where regular folks, patients like me, might find it. So we'll see, perhaps. But before we get started, I understand from you that we have another listener question. That's right. Yay. Good, good. <laughs> a listener from Central Florida, and I'm just going to read this out, says... I'm curious about the common things some thyroid patients use or have prescribed to them that might disrupt their thyroid function. Just to provide a few examples, certain supplements or some ingredients in over-the-counter allergy medicines. Also, prescriptions for autoimmune disorders like, say, psoriatic arthritis or certain foods taken with thyroid meds. Or even commonly prescribed steroid that's often prescribed to lower inflammatory levels. I've seen on a few product labels that thyroid patients should consult a provider before taking certain medications. How crucial is timing the use of these substances when taking thyroid medication? Wow, that's that's a great question. That's good. And I think there's a couple of different parts to it. So there's there's just the timing part. Let's do that first. So whenever you take anything that's not your thyroid medicine, try and wait like a half hour. So remember you want to take your thyroid medicine on an empty stomach. Oh, it's a half hour? At oh, least. I've always do it like two hours. I know. I that's that what case. they say. Oh, oh, okay. I usually... Wow. <laughs> if you talk to... The, we can ask Juan this th- next week, okay. the pharmacist who's coming, but they'll tell you two hours. If you give a half hour, that's more than enough. I mean, oh, it's tough. Life, to, that's life changing. I know. Because if you're like taking it first thing in the morning and you're waiting to have your cup of coffee, it's like, it, it's like eons if you're waiting two hours. Like I'll have you have patients that wake up at... 4 a.m. just so they can have their to take their thyroid medicine just so they can have their coffee when they wake up that's i mean that that's ex- overboard okay. that explains something <laughs> that someone told me that when they get up in the middle of the night they take their thyroid medicine and i right. remember thinking all right but i didn't i didn't want to ask like why yeah i don't know i just seemed too personal but now i bet you that's it that's probably it wow okay and half an hour okay well <laughs> my, we're done that's all we needed that's a wrap <laughs> That's so great. just, and then to a different part of the question about the allergy, the over-the-counter allergy medicines, a lot of them have denphonhydramine in them. So that's a stimulant. So that can cause palpitation. So that can, if you're already on thyroid medication it can, and you might have a palpitation every now and then, it can make it worse. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so, but again, you know, if you need your allergy medicine, just, just be aware. And again, try and spread yeah. it out. Now, there's a third part of this question when we bring up steroids. So steroids can alter how the, the your labs look. It doesn't alter how the medicine works, but it can make your TSH, remember TSH is kind of the indirect thyroid hormone that's related to thyroid function. It can make your TSH look a little lower than it actually is. So you get your labs drawn and you're on steroids your doctor may say, whoa, it looks like we got to cut back on your, your thyroid medication. So, but I, I don't want you to tell your doctor that. They, they may or may not know that, but it, just so you know oh, that your, your thyroid levels may look a little bit different. It's not altering how the thyroid's actually working. That's really interesting too. Yeah. You, I would have assumed that meant it changed the actual. No, it's just, it, wow. it interferes with the assay a little bit. I'll be darned. Okay, and the that pituitary was a good question. Evaluation. Yeah. So, see, there was there's a lot more to that question wow. than meets the eye. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, so, uh, that was great actually. But yeah. that, that really was a great question. So, and we have a, a lot of great questions that come in. Um, and I just want to say recently we received a surprising number of really great questions and they're, they're all, they are all too important and a bit too complex to squeeze into a regular episode on some unrelated topic. Um, so we've decided to plan a questions only episode. We hope to do this in the near future. So I'll have enough time to more thoroughly answer the questions that I feel are appropriate for the scope of the show. Because, you know, there's not like a simple answer to some of these questions. Um, it's important to remember that we can't provide specific answers about a particular patient's care or unique situation. We can just kind of give some general um, general answers because it's outside of the general education scope of the show. So, we, we, But we really do try. There are so many factors involved in every person's care, which is why we say in every episode, you must consult your own health care provider for specific questions related to your own care. So, um, so again, please keep the questions coming. Um, know that we're going to try and answer them and as well as we can, and that we're going to have a questions only episode coming up in the next few months. So great. All right. I'm looking forward to that. And I think it'll be fun. I do too, because our listener questions invariably, well, that one, I mean, they who, who invariably thought? bring up things that I never would have thought of. Um, and you're right, though, about the scope, because the questions help other people. It isn't just about the person writing the question, but it may really help many, many other, not just patients, too, but healthcare providers as well. Um, so the questions can introduce us all to topics that we'd not previously considered. Exactly. And then, you know, in some instances that may like spark a whole episode where we didn't think of doing. So. As, as, it, as it has, I think. Um, okay, well, let's shift to another serious subject. And that's our topic today, thyroid disruptors. And I think we can guess from the name a little bit about what these substances do and what they are. They disrupt important functions and they can be trouble. And I'd like to know more about how they're disruptive to normal thyroid function. And I have to say, and this is not a commercial, this is not an embedded commercial <laughs> here. And you did not ask me to say this, but I am so glad I had the chapter in your book to read to guide <laughs> me through this very complex topic. I was just sincerely glad of that. Aww. It was really helpful. It, it can be a bit overwhelming. Wow. Um, yeah. Complicated. Well, and, well, thanks, Dawn. But here's the thing when it comes to endocrine disruptors. We are exposed to an incredible variety of chemicals every single day. This might be a shock. There are over 85,000 man-made chemicals in our world that we encounter on a regular daily basis. <laughs> you know, that almost like is like a horror uh, movie. I know. 85,000 seems like a deeply disturbing number, and I... I wish I could unhear it. Um, <laughs> my guess is that that many simply cannot be monitored in any meaningful way. Right, right. And only about 1% of these 85,000 compounds have been studied for safety, despite having a high risk of toxicity to our health. That's almost unbelievable. It's insane. It's it, That's a scary thing. That's hor horrific too, yes. Yeah, there's increasing evidence that points to the harm of a specific group of chemicals that impact our hormones. They're known as endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs. This particular group of compounds interferes with the functioning of the endocrine system. So to recap, the endocrine system is comprised of all the glands that make up our body's hormones, the, the oh-so-important chemical messengers of our body. But these compounds, these EDCs, have been associated with many adverse health effects, including fertility issues, obesity, and tumors. The countless chemical exposures we face that, that are the subject of this much current research might possibly interfere with our thyroid's best function on many, many different levels. For example, thyroid disruptors can affect how our bodies take up iodine, how our thyroid makes both T4 and T3, and how we convert T4 to the active T3. I don't... It's probably hard to determine this, but what are a few of the most common compounds that we might, all of us, have the most frequent exposure to? The following are just a few of the most common disruptors, really in no particular order. There's bisphenol A, or BPAs. There's PFAs and PFOSs. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh. It's already getting very complicated. 
there's fluoride, there's PCBs, there's PBDEs, <laughs> cadmium, pesticides, and herbicides. And it's not funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's just... Well, <clears throat> she's laughing because I've decided not to <clears throat> pronounce yeah. the very oh, no. long <laughs> compounds. <laughs> no, I, that's, no it, what, that really wasn't. I, it just overwhelmed me for a minute, all those... You know, Acronyms. he just overwhelmed me for a minute, but I'm, I'm back. It's but we're going to talk about these in a little more detail, so it'll make more sense. Well, I'm aware of BPAs, and I try to find that, – that's really why I was laughing, because I'm high, a little bit hyper-aware of BPAs, <clears throat> but the others, you know, a little bit escaped me. Um, I do try to find reusable sport water bottles, for example, that say they are BPA-free. Of course, then I think about the other chemicals that might still be lurking in there, ones that I know nothing about, which I might have just found out in that list there. Um, yeah, and it can be a little disturbing. <laughs> well, BPAs are common chemicals that are mainly used in the production of polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins. So polycarbonate plastics, you ask, are used in some food and drink packages, like some water bottles. Not all, but some. Epoxy resins are used to coat metal products like cans and see again this is why i'm laughing because it's so it's not funny i don't find it funny it's just so ironic because i was always so pleased when i would out a can that i know was lined and i felt you know like wow well that's really good this keeps the metal from leaching into the not i don't know if it does or not it, it was just a perception on my part that this keeps the um you know, the acidic contents, whatever it might be, uh, from leaching into the food and the metal, like acidic canned foods. So sometimes I think we all try to fix one thing. Right. And then do we our find best. another obstacle. So what is, what do you think is the most likely way we are exposed to BPAs? Well, mainly it's through our diet, actually. So how do BPAs affect our thyroid, you ask? Well, BPAs alter how effectively our thyroid works to do all of its super important jobs that we talk about all the time on Thyroid Dog. Some of us might also have heard of two other compounds that are sometimes in the news, but I have to have <laughs> you pronounce them and not me, not even going to try. Sure. Per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAs, and perfluoroctane sulfonate, POS, are man-made chemicals that have been commonly used in industry. So PFAs can be found in some, some not all, nonstick chemicals used in some brands of cookware. And PFOS are used in stain-resistant coatings used on carpets and other fabrics. There's pretty little exposure to PFAs and PFOs as from the products we buy today, but they can be found in contaminated drinking water. These chemicals can decrease T4 production, resulting in decreased overall thyroid function. Now, say I'm concerned now again to find fluoride on your list, next on your list, because I just always felt really good, like like lined cans. <laughs> I felt so good about fluoride being added to water. I know, and I grew up in an area, I grew up in Delaware, and that's with fluorinated water. That was like a, considered to be a really good thing. Big deal. And fluoride is a common chemical found in the environment, but our main exposure is through dental care treatments and fluoridated water, like when I was growing up. Fluoridated drinking water is found in many countries and about half of the United States. The thyroid is very sensitive to high levels of fluoride. Fluoride can interfere with thyroid function by decreasing its production of both T4 and T3. You know, in fact, fluoride in the past was used as an anti-thyroid drug for hyperthyroidism because it was found to induce hypothyroidism. Isn't that crazy? Unbelievable. Yes. People who live in regions with fluoridation of drinking water may, or may, they, they may, not everyone there, but they may have a high risk of developing hypothyroidism. And fluoride may actually worsen iodine deficiency if it's pre present. So if you're already iodine deficient, fluoride can make it worse. And we all know how iodine is important for our thyroid's production of thyroid hormone. I think many of us, may, well, now you know I want to tease you about iodine. <laughs> we did, bringing up iodine. Um, just joking. Just teasing you. Um, we, like, uh, we, we like to talk about iodine and seaweed on the show. That's right. Um, so I think many of us might have heard the term PCBs and maybe not in such a good way. Right. PCBs, or polychlorinated biphenyls, are man-made organic chemicals known as chlorinated hydrocarbons. 
Due to their toxicity, manufacturing of PCBs was banned in 1979. PCBs were used in industry and commercial production because of their non-flammable and chemically stable nature. So they wouldn't blow up. And See, you're trying to do a good thing. <laughs> I'm trying to do a good thing. Nowadays, PCBs can be found in old fluorescent lighting fixtures and appliances like refrigerators and TV sets. So you mentioned non-flammable and chemically stable. And again, like we just said, I'm so <laughs> reminded that we often try to fix one thing or create a better thing. Or do something more cheaply, and then we end up creating a whole set of other problems. Um, are PCBs also found in the food chain? I'm not sure I want to know the answer. <laughs> they are. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Food sources of PCBs are fish, especially like sport fish caught in contaminated lakes or rivers, meat and dairy products. So PCBs decrease the conversion of T4 to active T3, but also increase the breakdown of T4 and T3, decreasing thyroid hormone's half-life. Well, I could be wrong, but I might recall hearing a lot that was negative about certain flame retardant products. And, and again, flame retardant, that's a good thing. Um, especially, I think, children's clothing years back. Um, so, again, you know, trying to fix one thing. Um, <laughs> you don't want kids to burn off. <laughs> yeah, you know, I th was all about flame retardant, you know, products. Seems like a really good thing. Um so I think we may recall hearing some that was negative now in retrospect. Um, and perhaps that's changed now or, you know, it could have been something different. But I could just be remembering wrong. Is there, no, some, is there right. something to that? You're right. Flame retardants, known as polybrominated diphenyl ethers or PBDEs, mm -mm. are a type of toxin found in many consumer goods, goods that may harm the thyroid. They're found in common household items such as computer and TV screens carpet padding, and some furniture. PBDEs contain bromine, a halogen that's a thyroid disruptor. Flame retardants have a similar, similar structure to T4 and can bump T4 from its oh, binding proteins. Okay, that's interesting. The result is alteration of T4's transport in the blood, and basically it can't get to the tissues that so need its, its thyroid wow. hormone. Yeah, and not to put too fine a point on it, here's an understatement, but that doesn't sound like it's good for it's, our thyroid. It's no bueno. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> the thyroid's so important, but so sensitive to many, many things. It is, and gosh, I live so much of my life without knowing that. <laughs> now, I, now You can't I, unknow it now, now. I know. Now I think about it all the time. Um, <laughs> so next, about cadmium. Now, thanks to your book, I better understand why you recommend that I take selenium. <laughs> yes, and we'll cover that. But cadmium is a toxic metal that is found both naturally and as a pollutant. Sources include some, some foods, drinking water, and tobacco. Yet another reason to stop smoking. You know what? Or even better, don't start. Mm -hmm. We're all exposed to cadmium in low levels from environmental sources. But in high doses, cadmium can be deposited in many tissues including our liver, our kidneys, our muscles, and, our, and the thyroid. Cadmium has been associated with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. But the biggest problem with cadmium is the way in which it depletes our body's selenium stores. What's more, selenium is needed to remove cadmium from the body. It's a vicious cycle. Remember that selenium is required to convert T4 to active T3 and that it helps protect the thyroid from oxidation. It's our thyroid's protector. I take it every day now. <laughs> she just, and I do, and I will be making, I'll make sure. I'll be making sure every I'm single day. I'm kind bit. of, mm. really, it's iodine and selenium are my two Right up things. there. <laughs> to describe oxidation scientifically is a bit complex. So let's think of it for this example as simply a sort of breaking down, a loss of functional integrity. You might imagine the process of metal rusting as a visual example. So in the case of the thyroid, when selenium is insufficient, it is the thyroid that becomes damaged. Not red rust in the real world example, but a breaking down of the thyroid's ability to do its work properly. The end result is an increase in autoimmune thyroid disease and possible hypothyroidism. So selenium may just have replaced seafood, seafood in my <laughs> pyramid of favorite thyroid things. Um, okay, no. But 
yeah, they're going to have to share the winner's platform. You know, I can't, yes. I can't bump seaweed off. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, they'll have to share. So the next thing on your list, um, the next two things actually on your list are pesticides and herbicides. And I have really mixed feelings about these. You know, if I'm <laughs> honest, I hate fire ants. I really hate them too. I hate them. And they are so dangerous for people they can be very dangerous for your pets i I just hate them i have a thing um of course i don't want certain bugs in the house um so pesticides have a place for me in a place in the world for me when used properly and with extreme care and diligence and when they do not harm ladybugs because i just have to throw in there ladybugs are not the very similar looking beetle that can actually bite ladybugs no biting so don't get confused about that um <laughs> there's a story behind this which we'll tell in another episode I, i'm gonna make a stop i like stuff. the cute ladybugs uh, yes yes they don't have biting mouth parts <laughs> um but there's a different but there's an imposter bug okay that's a different subject different day um ladybugs just only do good for the world in our garden so i don't want to kill them so my complicated story is that decades ago, in a different city, I had a multi-level raised organic herb garden on the side of my house. Nice. Oh, it was lovely. We built it ourselves. I grew organic vegetables and herbs that we ate. We really did build it ourselves from scratch. It was lovely. But, you know, it was not behind a protective fence. It was just out in our own yard on the open side because the light was perfect there. One day I came home after nurturing this garden for just the longest time and really loving it. And when you would walk past it, the, her- the herbs would release their scent. Oh, my gosh. It was, you know, if you brushed up I feel like I was there. I, it, it, I'm telling you. It was really very important to me. Um, but one day I came home and I fi- found a yard sign out in the front telling me that the service treatment for our yard had been done. Well, that was really interesting because because I had that organic garden back then, um, and probably other reasons too, I did not have a yard service. But the neighbor across the street had a yard oh, service. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turns out the tech had come to the wrong address. Um, and apparently treated my yard instead of the neighbor's. Because I think it would be really difficult for him to treat the neighbor's yard then walk across the street and plant the sign in my... You know, I mean, that seems an unlikely scenario. Unlikely. So uh, I was absolutely devastated. I called the pest company right away. I was told the tech probably didn't spray edible plants. He probably could tell they were edible. Well... Okay. But he just took the stand, sign there. Um, out in the front, yeah, because this was on the side, but the sign was way up front. You know how they do. So anyway, probably. You know that word never gives, you know, I have a problem with that word. It never gives me confidence. So I tore that whole thing out. We never put anything edible in its place. I told the neighbor what had happened so he could get his yard treated because he paid for it. Um, but I did not ask what chemicals he was supposed to have had applied because at that point, you know what? It didn't matter. I didn't trust anything anybody told me uh, now. Um, I didn't trust what they said. I didn't trust what they said they did or didn't do. There was not. There's just no, no trust left. Um, so we just tore it out, and that was the end of it. Um, because, I mean, it, my feeling was, if you can't have confirmed the address, then any level of po- there's any level of possibilities. Um, so that was a really good but harsh life lesson, um, as life lessons so often <laughs> seem to be. Oh well, yeah, it still hurts. I feel bad for you. I would have been. Later. I would have been really upset. Oh, by I that. was. Oh my I'm sorry. golly! <laughs> I'm sorry that happened. To that you. was a bad day. A lot. Yeah, there might have been yelling. <laughs> ah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. So. Just the idea that it could happen at all, I think, is what shook me the most. Um, not More than the fact that it happened. The fact that something like that could happen. Um, and again, I repeat, it was a beautiful organic garden. So I was pretty sure they did not come along and use manure, you know, 
uh, the, just pure manure fertilizer or whatever it was I was using back then. I don't even remember. Um, nor did I imagine that they stood there and handpicked the destructive bugs off with tweezers. So. You know, uh, I handpicked bugs <laughs> off, uh, all the while carefully avoiding hurting bees and ladybugs, you know. So, yeah, breaks my heart. Oh, I'm there sorry. you go. It's all right. I'm sorry, but it's okay. Unfortunately, I think your your story mm-hmm. points to the bad parts of some pesticides. And some pesticides and herbicides comprise another group of prevalent environmental toxins that have the potential to adversely affect thyroid function, too. Exposure to these chemicals has been associated with hypothyroidism. Pesticides and herbicides disrupt thyroid function on a number of different levels. Not good. Mm-mm. Not good. So, well... Here's another one. Lead is a toxic heavy metal in our environment. So lead can be found in the paint of some older homes, inexpensive metal jewelry, leaded ceramics, crystal. Exposure to lead has been associated with hypothyroidism as well. It interferes with production of T4. And in addition, I think, uh, to development, possible yeah. developmental problems for children who are exposed to it in certain ways. That's exactly right. Exposure to lead can seriously harm a child's health including damage to the brain and nervous system. It can slow their development, their learning. It can, they can even have like hearing and speech issues. So next on our list of EDCs is mercury. Common sources of mercury exposure include dental amalgams and pollution from coal-burning power plants. And by dental amalgams, you're referring to certain types of metal fillings. Is that correct? That's correct. That's right. You know, approximately half of the dental amalgam is elemental mercury by weight so that just the weight of it is it's half mer- mercury and it's in your mouth an amalgam can release small amounts of mercury vapor every time you chew but the most common way people in the united states are exposed to mercury is by eating fish that's contaminated by methyl mercury so what mer- mercury does is it can accumulate in the thyroid and reduce iodide uptake that results in decreased thyroid hormone production. And you were saying iodide, the, the D, yes. not iodine, but iodide. Exactly. The D. Okay. You got it. Um, so listeners, do a little research on this if you're interested. I, it could be 100% wrong. I believe I've heard and read that there are certain fish that are safer to eat due to, say, what they eat, where they eat it, um, are they a bottom feeder or not, and how long they live. So... That may control how much how much of a That's substance true, yeah. they absorb, um, and not to mention the quality of the waters in which they live, and maybe the environment you know uh, around them. So there's probably many other factors. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know you're exactly right. Well, do, everybody just look it up. Do some research. <laughs> do do a little research. So you let me know. You know, let us know. Because um, I read things, and sometimes I file it way in the way back you know and then it <laughs> wants to bubble up um so now aluminum is an edc that i don't think i can get away from very easily because it seems like it's everywhere i just looked in my kitchen doing a quick check and <laughs> looked like it was everywhere and now i'm wondering you know about my tea kettle oh. and, you know i think I, I think it's stainless i think it i think you're okay. i think it's stainless steel i'm not sure but now i'm gonna have to take a good look <laughs> so aluminum is the last edc we're going to discuss today Aluminum in the food supply comes from natural sources, including water, food additives, and contamination by aluminum utensils and containers. Aluminum can also be found in antacids and body care products like deodorant. And I'm aware now when buying deodorant, for example, that there are products, options that do not right. contain aluminum. Right. Um, there are also deodorant crystals, a form of, I think it's a form of salt. Mm-hmm. Um, which is easy to apply, like a deodorant comes like a deodorant stick, no aluminum. But why do we want to avoid overexposure? Well, aluminum in excess can damage the thyroid and, there, and thereby affect thyroid hormone production. Aluminum can also result in autoimmune thyroid disease, like Hashimoto thyroiditis. I feel like there's literally no way to avoid all or even many of the thyroid disruptors. My feeling is all we can do is try to is try to limit our exposure. Would would you say that's accurate? That's completely accurate. You know, because let's face it, we can't completely get rid of our exposure to EDCs because the world in which we live. But we can try and limit their effects on our bodies. 
How can we try to help our bodies and our thyroids to better handle the exposure we get? Okay, so here's some tips. Try to keep your thyroid micronutrients, like iodine and selenium, at optimal levels. That may help to decrease some of the effects of thyroid disruptors. Try and limit effects, the effects of toxins in drinking and bath water. You can do this by a high-quality water filter. Reverse osmosis filters are a great way to remove perchlorate, pesticides, PCBs, plastics, and, and many heavy metals. I know this, I say this all the time, try and eat organic food. Because when you eat organic food, you're avoiding some pesticides and herbicides. Avoid some pesticides in your yards because, you know, even your beloved furry little friends can inadvertently bring toxins in from the outdoors. These chemicals aren't good for them either. So be mindful of their exposure too. We're all in this together. Keep them safe. Try and limit the use of plastics and antibacterial products. BPA-free options are better, but they can still alter thyroid function. It's best to try and avoid them altogether if possible. Try to avoid using certain types of nonstick cookware. Chemicals from certain nonstick cookware can get into prepared meals and then lead to thyroid disruption. Consider using stainless steel or enameled cast iron cookware instead. For more information on specific products, you can check out the Environmental Working Group at www.ewg.org. I'm going to also post this at the end of this episode. I'd also like to add that detoxification is a critical way to help our bodies handle EDCs. How to detoxify and what is involved is a whole topic in and of its own that you know we're going to have to tackle in a separate future episode. Wow, that was a lot. That was intense. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yes, it was a lot. I'm still thinking through that. <laughs> well, listeners, thank you for sharing your time with us. I hope you found this discussion was helpful. Let us know. In our next episode, number 19, we'll cover compounding pharmacies. That's going to be interesting, I think. <laughs> our very special guest would be Juan Lopez, a brilliant local compounding pharmacist in Maitland, Florida. I've become friends with Juan as I've grown to trust him to assist my patients with their specially made prescription medications. I'd also act like to add something, Don. I forgot. If you look at our logo, this is our new and improved oh, thyra logo yes oh my goodness that's i'm right. so glad you mentioned that so listeners if you look at our logo oh, this yes, is the yes. the new and improved thyra she's very sassy is she across the board on your social media is she does she's, she appear she's gonna be on yeah wow oh yes that's a, <laughs> i'm so glad you mentioned that i forgot that well we love thyra in all her iterations but this is a new and a new it's a new iteration she's thyra is thyra just and, it, and she is beautiful just beautifully done yes good job special shout out to robin who um, did that. So good job. Very nice. I wanted to do this podcast to provide life-saving education and to encourage folks to see a doctor in time to prevent or minimize damage. That's deeply fulfilling. I enjoy helping folks understand how all aspects of their lives are tied to both thyroid and overall health. As always, my goal is to help us live more fulfilling lives by taking control of our health and thus feel our best. In fact, that's why I went into endocrinology. It's a medical art that combines science with the study of our lives and all that they encompass. And as always, we hope our listeners will continue listening to Thyroid Talk with Dr. Angela Mazza. We have many more interesting episodes planned. We'll build on today's foundation and cover many topics that we hope you'll find meaningful. And just to recap now, some of what we've covered in today's episode, and not necessarily in this order. What EDCs are and how they may affect our thyroid function specific EDCs and where they can be found. If we don't know how we may be exposed, how can we avoid them? We also learn that we cannot completely avoid EDCs, but there are ways that can better help our bodies handle them. And best of all, we learn that we can impact our thyroid health. As Dr. Mazza mentioned, and I'll just do another little thyra shout out because <laughs> I I am really distracted. Yeah, thyra is just amazing, and I really really love her, and I I really love this iteration, really really beautiful. Yeah, everybody should see that. Um, 
So, as you mentioned, in our next episode, number 19, we will discuss compounding pharmacies. And Juan Lopez, as Dr. Mazza said, a compounding pharmacist, will be our very special and first guest. I hope he's ready. Oh, I'm sure it will <laughs> be. You know it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to meeting him and to finding out about his very important work. His work is crucial. It's very important. Absolutely crucial. My goodness. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that'll be that'll be fun. Something to look forward to. <laughs> For information on at least some of the supplements we may discuss on the show, please visit the wellness store at metaboliccenterforwellness.com. Full disclosure, I personally use and I carry supplements by Douglas Laboratory and Pure Encapsulations in both my office and at our online site. Please stay in touch. Check out my YouTube channel at Dr. Angela Mazza, the website at Metabolic Center for Wellness as well as Facebook and Instagram. And we welcome your input. Please send your comments, show ideas, and questions to thyroidtalk.maza at gmail.com. That's an email address, not a message board. Other listeners will not be reading your message on any sort of public forum. We may disclose your general location on air, the city or town, for example, but we will not read your name nor your address on the show, and we reserve the right to edit your input as necessary. And coming soon, watch for pre-order availability for Dr. Maz's book, Thyroid Talk, an integrative guide to optimal thyroid health. Plus, added bonus, there will be an online master course related to the book, to help guide you to optimal thyroid health. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that because that's that's kind of a new um, level of what we're trying to do because everybody's journey to optimal thyroid health and feeling their best is different. So the goal of the masterclass is to help you walk the talk. Awesome. That's really a big, that's something to look forward to too. Yeah. Ooh, there's a lot going on. Yeah, so that's kind of been like, why there's been a little bit of a delay in the book coming up because we want them to be kind of alongside each other. Yeah, well, that's a good reason. So listeners, don't forget to ask your healthcare provider about any specific questions regarding your wellness. This podcast is meant for educational purposes only. <laughs>